from a couple of weeks ago, I discovered my spear shaft was bent in another direction. Now it's shooting 150 mils to the left and a few centimeters down. So we have to aim up and to the right to get the fish. Soon the shaft's gonna be so bent, I'm gonna to have to shoot backwards just to get the fish. Let's see how it works. Too easy, maybe the snapper out back will be more of a challenge. Let's just take a look at where I'm aiming to hit the fish. You can see how bent the shaft is and why it moves to the left. But if we look at the straight line of where I'm actually aiming, it is about here. To hit the fish, about here. So it's all good. A few days later, I need to say hello to Margarita and upload a video. I sail to a place called East Cocos Banderos Chaos, where I can just get reception from the Guna town Nagana over here. Ideally, it would be better for me to anchor closer around here, but I try to avoid any of the boxed areas here since the weather from Panama's volatile mountains swoop down with extreme ferocity at times. Even East Cocos Banderos here gets hit occasionally, but the Hollandaise hardly ever gets hit at all. That's why I'm usually out there. The YouTube video is uploaded to the phone and the phone goes into a waterproof bag and then up the mast to upload. I'll check this later in the day. Because uploading takes somewhere between 8 and 36 hours, would you believe, for one single YouTube video, I will likely have to spend the night here, which looks to be a good idea since this cell here is sliding past us and looks like it will go to where I just come from, the Hollandaise. That's a piece of luck, people. Yeah, maybe I'll go spearfishing away from this cell. At least my fins have evened up a bit. When the left one was longer not too long ago, it was a bit like a one-legged duck swimming in circles. I'm going to do something different today. I'm going to spear four common fish found on the reefs, three of which should be good eating and one that is supposed to be foul eating. I have absolutely nowhere to hide here and this dog snapper is very edgy. Now I could take the shot, but we're going to go for different fish today, all in the name of science. Thank you. 
This is a schoolmaster snapper here. I'll get one of these later. I'm after a mahogany snapper right now. It has a black spot close to the tail and it sort of has a reddish tinge on the body. This is a black margate, a member of the grunt family and hence can have a strong iodine taste. We'll shoot one of these another time because just over there is a mahogany snapper. There we go, but I better make up my mind pretty quickly. That's a piece of luck, uh, normally they're much smaller. Um, I like the small ones a lot, they're really good for smoking. What we might do is, I've never had one that big, so we'll see how tough it is if the skin goes crispy when we do barbecue. And there's a schoolmaster snapper. It looks small enough, but I was actually after a smaller one. I'll tell you why later. Dog snapper is not on the menu today, so this is just practice. This would be all too easy. Not to mention this. There's a nice little shark, and these I believe are grey snappers. This is tiny, but I'm eating four fish, so it's got to be small people. And this is the terrible tasting fish. Stay tuned for what it is and a discussion on it. Now because of my GoPro 7 dying, the sound now is really poor quality, even for my channel. So I'll paraphrase and do voiceovers. I'm saying blah blah this, blah blah that. This is a mahogany snapper, slight reddish tinge with a spot near the tail. This is the largest one I've ever seen. Usually they are half the size. The flesh is quite soft, which leads me to believe that they would be great for smoking. This is a schoolmaster snapper. They tend to not get bigger than 45 centimeters or 18 inches, but their eating quality is much better when they are small. I should have got one about this size, they tend to get really chewy as they get bigger, so best to get as small as legally possible. Also when barbecued their skin goes crispy and is delicious, but only if they are small. This I believe is a grey snapper, in the water it's very light grey with a dark stripe near their eye, but looking at it now in death and out of the water it's become quite colourful. Go figure, I've shot one about this big, but that is very rare. Apparently they grow to two feet, but I've never seen any like that. Now in the interest of science, and because they are absolutely everywhere in large numbers, I have shot a chub. In Australia they are called silver drummer, it's pooing on me right there people. They are generally regarded as very poor eating, I have tried one in Australia a long time ago and all I remember is that it was terrible, very coarse flesh and very chewy. They can grow up to 10 kilograms, but I would suggest that these would be unbelievably bad to eat. A book written by Rube Allen called Florida Fishes said they were good eating, but you have to eat them immediately. And another book said their flesh quality varies widely, sometimes good, sometimes bad. So I guess in a pinch you could eat a small one like this one I have, I'll give it a go anyway. I love how with fishing around deserted islands you can go from this 
to this in half an hour. Okay, the science is happening right here, but there are fundamental flaws in my science method, people. Um, do you want me to go into them? Okay, let's be bored out of our brain just for once, because ours is an exciting channel. Yes, yes it is. Nothing but quality, unreal. What's wrong with my scientific method, people? Well, number one, all fish should have been approximately the same size. All fish should be cooked exactly the same way, except the silver drummer or the chub, uh, as it's known in the Caribbean, is going to be steamed. So that's going to vary. But I do remember it being the a very coarse flesh. So if we steam it, maybe it'll be uh, more palatable. Uh, so basically my scientific method is lacking in lots of details, but that's okay. The crispy skin of the grey snapper is the best, better than chips. The best crispy skin is from usually the smallest fish. I just love barbecued fish. It's so simple, all you need is a bit of salt sprinkled on the fish. And the best combination is sweet potato, mixed with that saltiness. The schoolmaster was not chewy, so that size was good, but I wouldn't go any bigger. But the winner was the mahogany snapper, followed closely by the schoolmaster and then the grey snapper. Surprising, since the grey snapper is the smallest and therefore should have been the sweetest of them all. I steamed the chub in foil because I thought it would not be as tough that way. Not much flavour, mostly white meat. It actually wasn't terrible, but if you're going to shoot one, make it small like this one I got. It's interesting to note that when we were exiled and at Morant Cays just south of Jamaica, there were very few chubs there, which shows that the Jamaicans eat them. So if you're in a pinch, you can eat them, but if there are other fish available, maybe leave them alone. So here is my not so comprehensive list. It doesn't include Australian fish because I ran out of room, but the emperors in Australia are snappers. So they would be five star. Tusk fish, whiting, sole and cobia, all five stars. Many people would argue with the jacks being only 2.5, but I regard them as not being too great. But if we were talking about golden trevally, then that would be three stars. Of course, there are some mackerel that are absolutely terrible, like the green mackerel in Australia. There you go, people. The fish world according to Plucky. See you next week.